and gentlemen, Elaine Stretch at Liberty. It's like the prostitute once said, it's not the work, it's the stairs. <laughs> the costumes! The costume designer for the musical company had me wear one white pearl earring and one gray pearl earring, and I do not know why. But I figured the part I played Joanne, she drank, so one night she just mixed them up. Later on in the run, however, I was told to wear my gray pearl earring on my downstage ear. The scenery. Curtain went up one night at the Music Box Theater on West 45th Street. I played the first scene of the play, Bus Stop with Phyllis Love. No laughs, very strange. The stage manager had goofed. The curtain was up, the asbestos was down. <laughs> the makeup. I hate it. I need it. <laughs> the props. One night, the property man on some who done it forgot to set a revolver underneath the husband's napkin. The husband was supposed to shoot the wife across the breakfast table. On cue, no revolver. The husband grabs a fistful of Schmucker's jam and shouts at his wife across the breakfast table, I'm going to kill you with this poison jelly. <laughs> it's a great actor. It's a lousy prop man. The audience that lifts you when you're down, not in Three Indelicate Ladies in Boston, not in the Cine Pat Muldoon in Wilmington, not in Dancing in the End Zone at the Coconut Grove Playhouse, not in Woman Bites Dog at the Wilbur Theater in Philadelphia, and not in I Found April at the Trinity Playhouse in McKeesport, Pennsylvania. To mention just a few. The headaches, the heartaches, the backaches, the flops. Been there, done that, got all the T-shirts. The sheriff who escorts you out of town, well, not exactly out of town, but out of the Variety Club in Philadelphia in a flop, drunk and disorderly at 5 o'clock in the morning. Well. <laughs> the opening when your heart beats like a drum, I'll drink to that and did. <laughs> the closing when the customers won't come. Shit. There's no business like show business. Like no business I know Everything about it is appealing Everything the traffic will allow No, where can you get that happy feeling When you are stealing that extra bow 1954, The Ed Sullivan Show Tonight, ladies and gentlemen On our really big shoe the shoe stopper from On Your Toes, Eileen Strick. <laughs> At 18210 Birchcrest Drive in the suburbs of Detroit, Michigan, my mother clicked off the television set and went upstairs to bed. I'll watch it when he gets her name right. <laughs> my father watched alone. There's no people like show people. They smile. When they are low, good for them. Even with a turkey that you know will fold. You may be stranded out in the cold. Still, you wouldn't trade it for a sack of gold. <laughs> Try me. <laughs> you have it with you? Maybe you left it in a cab. Did you leave it in a cab? Yesterday, they told you you would not go far. That night you open and there you are. Next day on your dressing room, they've hung a star. There's good news and there's bad news. And there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is I have got a terrific acceptance speech for a Tony. The bad news is I've had it for 45 years. <laughs> the good news is I want a Tony. The bad news is they cut the speech. Let's go. Oh, 
when I was growing up. Her name was Carrie. I called her Kaka. What did I know? She tough loved me to death. She ratted on me every chance she got. I was just crazy about her. One night, my mother and father were having the usual, well, no, not the usual, the occasional cocktail party in our sunken living room on Birchcrest Drive. And I was upstairs, age six, in my mother's bedroom. She had a full-length mirror, and I was looking in it, discovering... Well, gosh, I guess that's what I was doing. My backside. I'd never really noticed it before. I was just fascinated. Kaka happened to look in on me, let out a yell, ran downstairs, cocktail party in full swing. Mistrich! Mistrich! Come upstairs quick! Laney's up there looking at her ass. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sakes, Carrie, well, you never mind about that. Next thing you know, she'll be in show business. <laughs> Ten years later, I was. In uh, Twelfth Night by William Shakespeare at the Studio Theater of the Dramatic Workshop of the New School for Social Research in Greenwich Village on 12th Street in New York City. Directed by Erwin Piscotter, straight from the Berliner Ensemble. And who, let's see, Herbert Berghoff, uh, Uta Hagen, Stella Adler, Luther Adler, uh, Ben Ari, Shuto Dyer. Oh, and would you believe, Bertrand Brecht in attendance. There was another time Kaka caught up with me back there growing up in Michigan. When I was 15 years old, I had a, I had a serious beau. His name was Jimmy Lee. He was at the University of Michigan getting ready to graduate college. And I was still in high school at the Convent of the Sacred Heart. So you see, I was dating an older man. While the younger kids were eating hamburgers and drinking Miller's High Life, Jimmy and I, we were eating cocktail peanuts and drinking Canadian Club and ginger ale. And sometimes, God help us, at Ruby Bentley's black and tan joint in downtown Detroit, and I mean way downtown Detroit, the master of ceremonies, Ruby Bentley himself singing up a storm in black tie, hot pink lipstick, touch a blush, and false eyelashes. I loved it. So did Kaka. She was there with her husband. She didn't rat on me this time. She didn't have to. I took care of that myself the next morning upstairs, getting ready to go to mass. It was Sunday. And well within earshot of both my mother and father, I start singing. Full out. A ruby. Bentley special. I want a long time daddy who'll be ready any time I call. I said I want a long, 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 long time daddy who's gonna be ready any time that I call. Now, I don't want no greenhorn rookie like a soldier going to war. He's got all that big artillery and he don't know what it's for. I want a long time. Daddy, who's gonna be ready? And it's time. <laughs> what? What? What the hell is that 
you are singing about. Oh my God, my father exploded. The truth was, I didn't know what the hell that was I was singing about. I just knew it was groovy and bluesy, and I dug it, and I was grounded for two weeks. Oh, there was a few other lyrics, and this is a lot of years later. I didn't quite catch on to either. 1952, the revival of Rogers and Hart's Pal Joey, the musical comedy on Broadway. A uh, song called Zip, my song. I don't like a deep contralto or a man whose voice is alto. Zip, I'm a heterosexual. Now, I thought, I wasn't quite sure, but I thought, and I hadn't been out of Michigan too long now, remember, but I thought heterosexual meant gay. 1970, 1970, the musical company, The Ladies Who Lunch, a matinee, a pinter play, perhaps a piece of Mahler's. I thought Mahler's was a pastry shop on Broadway. Mahler's Pastries, 47th Street and Broadway. The ladies had lunch, they went to see a matinee, they saw a pinter play, and afterwards they went around the corner and had a cup of tea and a piece of Mahler's. <laughs> Made perfect sense to me. And when I brought it up to Stephen Sondheim, he said, Elaine, I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> this may come as a shock or, or a surprise or both, I don't know. But um, I have, I have in my time been known to lift a few. It all started in the sunken living room on Birchcrest Drive. My mother and father were having cocktails one evening with my two older sisters, Georgine and Sally. And I was almost 14. So my dad mixed up what must have been a mean whiskey sour, and he gave me half. And I drank it. A star was born. All at once, the room is reeling. Kaka announced dinner. Bells are peeling. They all went into the dining room. Butterflies are fluttering inside. I grabbed the cocktail shaker and detoured through the pantry and drank the other half. All at once, I've got this feeling. As I was turning into Betty Davis, Ethel Merman, Ingrid Bergman, Gertie Lawrence, and Fanny Bryce, I rejoined the family in the dining room. I dominated the dinner table conversation. The evening was mine. And I was only 13. This is all very new to me. This is all very fine. This so sunny like, kind of funny like, milk and honey like feeling of my. This is all very new to me. And I'm knocking on wood What to do What to say How to make it go on this way No problem More whiskey sours Or whatever On the very day that I graduated from the Convent of the Sacred Heart I made up my mind to have a heart-to-heart -heart with my pal, Reverend Mother Rademacher. Reverend Mother, I want to go to New York. I do, Reverend Mother. I want to go to New York, and I want to become an actress. I don't know why, but I do. I want to go to New York City, and I want to become an actress. And just like that, Mother Rademacher suggested another convent. <laughs> no, but this was, a, this was a sort of a finishing school in New York City. It was the old Otto Kahn mansion up on 91st and 5th Avenue. You see, Elaine, 
You can live there on 91st Street with the nuns, and your parents will approve of that. And then you can go out in New York City and choose an acting school where you can major in dramatics. And if you're half as good at that as what you've been getting away with around here for the past 12 years, you'll have nothing to worry about. My mother and dad took me to Michigan Central Station to board a train to New York City. Track 29! Boy, you can give me a shine. My mother picked up the tickets, and my dad and I had a cup of tea. That doesn't sound right. Should have been the other way around. Uh-oh, something was up. Oh, my God. Here it comes. Here it comes. It's a little late, but here it comes, the birds and the bees, and it's my father. Where in God's name is my mother? Blaney, I am your father, and I'm going to tell you something. And I want you to listen. No matter where you go in life, Laney, no matter what you do in life, Laney, you remember what I'm telling you today, and you never forget it. You are not the same after two martinis. Jesus. <laughs> I got on the train and I had four. <laughs> and as far as the birds and the bees are concerned, not one word about all that stuff. And I was a virgin until I was 30 years old. I shared that last bit of information with a psychoanalyst several years later in New York City. It was the only time I ever heard him clear his throat. <laughs> okay, okay, whoa! Here I am, here I am in New York City. And I'm doing just fine for a virgin. I'm blonde, I got blue eyes, I, I'm funny, I get laughs. I, I, I look great in a Dior suit. I got pretty good looking legs and I'm the best kisser in town. And that seemed to be quite enough for a lot of the hot shots in New York City. And then, there was this boy in my acting class, Marlon Brando. <laughs> Every single girl at the dramatic workshop of the New School for Social Research was in love with Marlon Brando, not me. And Marlon Brando dated every single girl at the dramatic workshop of the New School for Social Research, <laughs> not me. <laughs> of course, I was still 13 years shy of age 30, so I don't know, who knows, maybe the word was out. <laughs> Up at the convent, up at the convent, oh, I guess this was about two months into the first semester of the uh, dramatic workshop, my new best friend, Reverend Mother Benziker, and aside from my roommate, Yvonne Rogers, Reverend Mother was the only person in the whole world that I had told just how I really felt about Marlon Brando. And she was in her office one afternoon on the fifth floor, and I was in the parlor on the first floor learning lines, and I heard the telephone ring, and Reverend Mother Benziker answered it, and then she tied up her skirts and ran down four flights of stairs to the parlor. Elaine, it's for you. Elaine, it's him. I ran up four flights of stairs, three steps at a time. Hello? Oh, hi, Marlon. Oh, fine. You? Uh. <laughs> Tomorrow night? You want... Oh, ah... Uh. Well, I, it, it's, I'd have to, well, it's just at the, I, Marlon, can you hang on for just a minute? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. Amen. What time? <laughs> sounds good. That sounds good. Yes, well, well, looks like I'll see you then. <laughs> Yes, yes, right, right, you bet, right, bye-bye, bye-bye. <laughs> well, 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 what do you know? Oh, my God, what do you know about that? What do you know about that? Now, wait a minute, what will it be? What will it be? Italian, that's it, Italian. Italian, a small, intimate Italian restaurant. Red wine and and candlelight and some music and later maybe a ride in one of those buggies in Central Park at midnight maybe oh God, who knows 
Marlon Brando took me to a Methodist church. <laughs> he took me to a Jewish synagogue. He took me to a Church of Christ the Zionist. He took me to the public library. He took me to a Chinese restaurant, and he took me to a strip joint. <laughs> and at this strip joint, a tall redhead took off every stitch of her clothes, and I burst into tears. I think I was a lot younger than I thought I was. And then Marlon took me for a nightcap. His apartment was a three-flight walk-up on 12th Street. And we got up there, and, and I, uh, God, I was so... And he disappeared right off the bat into the bathroom. And, um, and he had this cat, and the cat was yowling. And I called out, Marlon, what's the matter with your cat? And he called back, she's in heat. And I called back, should I open the window? <laughs> Yes, I was. I was a lot younger than I thought I was. I don't think anybody's ever been as young as I was that night. Nobody. Never. Not ever. And then Marlon reappeared out of the bathroom in his pajamas. And it was 2 o'clock in the morning. And at 20 minutes past 2, I was on the 5th Avenue bus heading uptown. They ran both ways then. And it was, well, what was it? It was 3 a.m. by now. Poor Mother Benziker. She had to put on her entire nun's habit to come downstairs and let me in. <laughs> and from that morning on till almost the close of the season of Irwin Piscotter's summer theater in Saville, Long Island, Marlon Brando did not speak to me. No, I mean, not one word. I was scared. And I got brave one day and I asked him, Marlon, what is the matter? And Marlon said, Elaine, I want two things from you, silence and distance. <laughs> I ran to Piscotter. Mr. Piscotter, I want to go home. If you do, Ellen, Mr. Brando is the winner. We closed the season with Noel Coward's private lives. I got the lead. I was a stunning, almost 18-year-old, slightly confused Amanda. That next season in New York, my convent days were over. I was living at the Barberson Hotel for Women. And it was a late Sunday afternoon, and my telephone rang, and I answered it, and it was Marlon. And he asked me to meet him for a drink at George Hertz's Bar and Grill on Lexington Avenue, and I did. He ordered two Manhattan cocktails, and he just stared at his, and no one was speaking. And then he drank his, and then he crushed the cocktail glass in his hand. And his hand was bleeding. And he looked at me. And he said, Elaine, I'm sorry. Well, life went on. <clears throat> Marlon went on to do some play. A streetcar named Desire, I think it was. <laughs> and what did I do? Well, I graduated from the dramatic workshop, so I went, I went out in New York City to look for a job. I'm just a Broadway baby walking off my tired feet. Pounding 42nd Street To be in a show Oh Broadway, baby Learning how to sing and dance Waiting for that one big chance To be in a show 
Oh! Gee! I'd like to be on some marquee All twinkling lights A spark to pierce the dark from Battery Park to Washington Heights someday maybe all my dreams will be repaid heck I'd even play the maid to be in a show Mr. Producer? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, that was me. Yes, I am. Yes, I'm talking to you, sir. I don't need a lot. Only what I got. Plus a tube of grease paint and a follow spot. Broadway, baby. All afternoon And eating at a greasy spoon To save on my dough Oh! At my tiny flat There's just my cat A bed and a chair Still I'll stick it to for me from that very first production to Twelfth Night back at the new school when I tried out for Vila and I didn't get it. Mariah, I didn't get it. Lady Olivia, I didn't get it. You see, all those parts smacked of love and sex and relationships and I, honest to God, did not know how to deal with all that. And then I thought, Festy. Huh? The court jester. I can do that. Caps and bells, jokes and tricks. I can do that. I read for it. I got it. I was the clown. <laughs> no lovey-dovey stuff for me, but boy, could I cartwheel. <laughs> Mr. Piscotter was overjoyed. Ah, so, bravo, Ellen. Das is fantastic. Well, that clown must have given me confidence because I went on from there. I went on from there to Moliere, to Pirandello, to Strindberg, to Ibsen, to Chekhov to Hellman, to Coward, and then, what happened? My first go at a Broadway show, I get a review, a musical review, Angel in the Wings. Well, it turns out they wanted me for the comedy sketches. I called my mother and dad in Michigan. I got a part in a Broadway show. Oh, Laney, which one? Angel in the Wings, mother, it's a review. Oh, what songs do you have? Well, I don't have any songs. I'm just doing the sketches. No songs? No, Mother. And it's a review? Yes, Mother. A musical review? Yes, Mother. And you don't have a song? No, Mother. Well, then I'd forget about it. I went to our producer, Mr. Ewing. My mother thinks I should have a song. Mr. Ewing? 
So could I? Just one. A big meeting ensued at the Algonquin Hotel. That's where my producer lived. And I can just hear him. Okay, now look. Here's what we're going to do. This kid is great in the sketches. So we'll give her a song. And then when we get to Philadelphia, we'll cut it. <laughs> I got the song. We got to Philadelphia. They didn't cut it. I sang it eight times a week for almost a year and a half. This is the original choreography. Each morning, a missionary advertised with neon sign. He telling a population that civilization is fine. And three educated savages holler from a bamboo tree. That civilization is the thing for me to see. Bongo, 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 I don't want to leave the Congo. Oh, no, 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 no. Bingo, bango, bongo, I'm so happy in the jungle, I refuse to go. Don't want no bright lights, false teeth, doorbells, landlords, I make it clear. That no matter how they coax me, I stay right here. Don't want no high heels, mud pack, haircut, nail paint, padded brassiere, no. I got my spear, no matter how they coax me, I'm going to stay right here. They have something called a nuclear bomb. So I think I stay where I am. Civilization, I stay right here. I no go there. Dissolve, lap dissolve, Merman. Ethel Merman. I got an opportunity to audition for the standby to Ethel Merman in Irving Berlin's new musical, Call Me Madam. It was to play the part of Pearl Mesta, America's uh, ambassador to Lichtenburg. I was 20, I looked 40, I got the job. <laughs> One matinee day, I'm standing in the wings and I'm watching Miss Merman and she's on stage singing the money song to Paul Lucas, who played the uh, foreign minister in Lichtenburg. And through the lyrics of this song, she's offering the foreign minister of Lichtenburg however much money his country wants from her country on account of because she's in love with him. Money, 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 money. Can you use any money today? In the third aisle, on the aisle, in the third row, young guy suddenly yells out, Yeah, you can throw some my way, sweetheart. I sure can't goddamn well use a little bit of it. <laughs> Paying no attention, Miss Merman carries on. Money, 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 money. I've so much that I'm giving it away. Well, give some of it to me, Ethel, baby, for Christ's sake. <laughs> the music keeps playing, Miss Berman keeps singing. Nobody's doing nothing. Where's the house manager? Where the hell is the house manager? <laughs> Ethel Merman plows on. <laughs> and if that fellow with whiskers ever should decline, who gives a shit about him? <laughs> give a shit about him. <laughs> you can have mine at a girl, Ethel, baby. You lay it on me, sweetie poops. All of mine. You can damn well bet ass on it, Ethel. <laughs> too much, too much. She froze. Merman froze. Ethel Merman froze. I mean, she froze. <laughs> You can have. She then proceeded to walk off the stage, sweep by me in the wings, down that little staircase that leads out to the front of the house, through those little velvet curtains, up the side aisle, down the center aisle, grabs a hold of this guy, yanks him out of his seat, drags him up the center aisle, through those glass doors that lead out into the lobby, and dumps the son of a bitch on West 45th Street. She's back in the theater. 
She's back in the theater. She's down the center aisle. She crosses the first row of seats to the left of the orchestra, through the same little velvet curtains, up the same little stairway that leads back to backstage. Sweeped by me again in the wings and onto the stage, dead center, mine! So I'm standing by for Ethel Merman. Ethel Merman's never off, so I'm never on. For Ethel Merman, are you kidding? Please. Word is out along the Rialto. Word is out on Broadway that Julie Stein and Richard Rodgers are co-producing a revival of Rodgers and Hart's brilliant musical, Pal Joey. And it's opening cold in New York City at the Broadhurst Theater. No out-of-town tryout. I went along and I got an audition for Melba, the newspaper reporter who interviews Pal Joey. And Pal Joey, brat that he is, insults her. And she, in turn, sings a song called Zip by way of letting him know that she has fried fatter fish than he, including the famous striptease artist of the day, Miss Gypsy Rose Lee whose gimmick it was to present herself as a stripper, yes, but Gypsy Rose Lee presented herself as a highly intellectual, respectable, piss-elegant stripper into the bargain. It was a great part. I read for it, and I got it, and then it hit me. I can't do this. I've got a contract for Leland Hayward standing by for Ethel Merman. Hold it. Wait a minute. Mr. Hayward, I got a part in Pal Joey. Yes, uh, I, 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 it opens cold in New York at the, at the Broadhurst Theater. There's no out-of-town tryout. So, Mr. Hayward, if Ethel Merman is off at the Imperial Theater, and that'll be the day, right, Then and call me madam, then I'd have to be on and call me madam at the Imperial Theater. But if Ethel Merman is on and call me madam at the Imperial Theater, then I could be on and pal Joey at the Broadhurst Theater. Yes? He said yes. Mr. Stein? Pal Joey opens cold in New York, right at the Broadhurst Theater. There's no out-of-town tryout. Well, as you know, I've got, a, I've got a job standing by. I've got a contract with Leland Harry standing by for Ethel Merman and call me madam. But, uh, Mr. Stein, if, uh, if Ethel Merman is off, and that'll be the day, right? <laughs> Imperial Theater. Then, of course, I'd have to be on at the Imperial Theater and call me madam. But if Ethel Merman is on and call me madam at the Imperial Theater, then I could be on in Pal Joey at the Broadhurst Theater. Right? Right! He said, okay. All right, now here we go. The first run through of Pal Joey in New York City. <sighs> Richard Rogers and Julie Stein are not pleased. Company, we need a week in New Haven. Shit. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I used to date a guy at Yale University in New Haven with an MG, and I called him up. <laughs> I called him up. I called him up and I told him I missed him, and I asked him. <laughs> I asked him how long it would take to drive from the Imperial Theater in New York to the Schubert Theater in New Haven. Oh, my God. I think this is going to work. You see, I don't sing Zip in Pal Joey until the second act. So I figured if I check with Ethel Merman at half hour, 7.30, at the Imperial Theater in New York, I could be at the Schubert Theater in New Haven by 10 o'clock. Right? Right. So. Here's the deal. The Imperial Theater, New York City. Half hour, 7.30, check with Merman. I'm okay, Elaine. All right, so I'm out of there. I'm out of there and I'm off to New Haven in the MG with the ex-boyfriend from Yale. We arrive at New Haven, 9.45, give or take, and I'm out of the MG and onto the stage of the Schubert Theater a few minutes after 10, singing Zip. It's perfect. Perfect! The blizzard of 52. <laughs> At its peak, opening night of Pal Joey in New Haven. But I'm not in New Haven. I'm in New York and I'm checking with Merman. And it is snowing. The MG, out of the question. Miss Merman, on account of the blizzard, I have to take the train to New Haven. So, Miss Merman, would it be okay if I, uh, the train pulls out at uh, 7 p.m. from Penn Station? So, would it be okay if I check with you just a little bit earlier than 7.30? And in that way, you see, I can be, oh, Elaine, will you, for Christ's sake, go to New Haven and sing the fucking song? <laughs> I'm 
I'm on the train at 7 p.m. The train pulls out at 8 p.m. Never mind. I order a double brandy and I start the first decade of my rosary. And that old train, that old train pulls into New Haven and it's what? It's 12 minutes after 10. So that's it for me. That's it. I've had it. I've had it. I sing Zip at 10.15 in Pal Joey. And it's 12 minutes after 10. And the line at the cab stand, forget, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold it. I see a private car just about to pull away. Mom and dad in the front seat and four kids in the back. Would you roll your window? Would you roll, roll your window down? Yeah, thank you. I've got to go to the Schubert Theater. I really have to go to the Schubert Theater. And you're going to take me. <laughs> they took me. They took me. I'm in the back seat with the four kids, and I'm making conversation. Uh, how many in your family? Eight. Six in the car, and it turns out her mother and father live with them. What's your name? Giordano. It figures. Look, there will be, there'll be eight tickets at the box office of the Schubert Theater tomorrow night for pal Joey. <sighs> Schubert Theater. I'm out of the car, and I'm through the stage door and up the stairs to upstage left, where I was supposed to have had made my entrance and as God is my judge, see, it must have been snowing on everybody. As God is my judge, Helen Gallagher is singing the last two lines of her song, which just happens to be my cue to enter. My understudy is standing there, ready to go on in my costume. I've got on a Dior suit and a beaver fur coat and boots. I throw off the coat and I kick off the boots and I say to my understudy with quiet, frenzied desperation, give me your shoes. <laughs> you give me your shoes. I wore a seven, she wore a nine and a half. <laughs> Minnie Mouse in a Dior suit. I made my entrance. I've interviewed Pablo Picasso and a countess named DeFrosso. I've interviewed the great Stravinsky. But my greatest achievement was the interview I had with a star who worked for Minsky. I met her at the Yankee Clipper and she didn't unzip one zipper. I said, Miss Lee, you are such an artist. Tell me why you never miss. What do you think of while you work? And she said, while I work, my thoughts go something like this. Zip, Walter Lippmann wasn't brilliant today. Zip, will Saroyan ever write a great play? Zip, I was reading Schopenhauer last night. And I think that Schopenhauer was right. I don't want to see Zarina. I don't want to meet Cabina. Zip. I'm an intellectual. I don't like a deep contralto. Or a man whose voice is alto. Zip. I'm a heterosexual. Zip. It took intellect to master my art. Zip. Who the hell is Margie Hart? Schubert Theater, New Haven, New Hartford Railroad, 1205, train to New York City. Day two, Tuesday, half hour, 7.30. Check with Merman. Drive to New Haven. It stopped snowing. Arrive Schubert Theater. 10 o'clock, 10.15, zip. I consider Dolly's paintings past.
passe, the DR suit stayed in. Zip. Will they make the metropolitan pay? I wore my own shoes. Zip. English people don't say clerk, they say Clark. A Giordano's in the third row. Zip. Anybody who says Clark is a jerk. <laughs> Schubert Theater, New Haven, Merritt Parkway, New York. Day three, Wednesday, matinee day, Imperial Theater, half hour, two o'clock, first show, check with Merman, Merritt Parkway, New Haven, Schubert Theater. I adore the great Confucius and the lines of Luscious Lucius, zip. I am so eclectic. Schubert Theater, New Haven, Merritt Parkway, New York. Second show, half hour, 7.30, check with Merman. Merritt Parkway, New Haven, Schubert Theater. I don't care for either Mickey. Mouse Rooney makes me sicky. Zip. I'm a little hectic. Schubert Theater, New Haven, Merritt Parkway, New York. Day four and five. Thursday and Friday, cool by comparison. Day six, Saturday, another matinee day. Merman, Merritt, New Haven, Schubert, Schubert, New Haven, Merritt, New York. Merman, Merritt, New Haven, Schubert, Schubert, New Haven, Merritt, New York. And you wonder why I drank. Zip. Artistic taste is classic and dear. Zip. Whoa, the hell. was a huge success on Broadway. And at the opening night party, Leland Hayward offered me the Ethel Merman part in the national company of Call Me Madam, directed by the same fellow that directed Miss Merman, Mr. George Abbott. Now, if I accept this offer, <laughs> it would mean that I'd leave a smash hit on Broadway a supporting part with a great song, but then I'd get to tour the States, a leading lady with, I think, nine. Oh, God. Can I do that? I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. The tour began in Washington, D.C., and halfway through the second act at the dress rehearsal, I was in tears. Mr. Abbott, I can't do this. It's too much. Yes, you can do it, Elaine. It's not too much, and we can go on with Act Two. Or you can't do it, Elaine. It is too much, and we can all go home. <laughs> we toured the States to sold-out houses for well over a year. Nobody knew who the hell I was, but thanks to George Abbott, I guess I must have been doing something right. The tour was finally over, and I'm on my way back. Sounds familiar. I'm home. I'm home. Well, I'm where I've come to call home. And I'm being, I'm being, you know, seen around New York. El Morocco and the Stork. And the other stay up late cafes with guess who? Gig Young. I'm on the town with you these days. Adorable gig young. Married and divorced twice each. Not exactly a poster boy for a graduate of the Sacred Heart Convent. <laughs> Not to mention the niece of Cardinal Stritch of Chicago. But it didn't seem to bother gig. For we were strictly good time Charlies who liked to drink <laughs> and dance around and maybe kick romance around. He proposed. 
Gig Young proposed. Oh, boy, I was over the moon. Oh, boy, the Catholic Church was not. However, the Catholic Church did say that if Gig, 40 years ago in his hometown of St. Cloud, Minnesota, had not for some reason, ex-wives or no ex-wives, been baptized, then we could go for it. We could go for it right down the center aisle. Go figure. Well, Gig flew to St. Cloud, Minnesota to check with his Baptist minister. I went to St. Louis to do a couple of weeks of summer stock. I got a telegram opening night. Elaine, will you marry me? I have never been baptized. Gig. So now, this unbaptized Baptist <laughs> had to become a baptized Catholic. So Gig flew to L.A. not only to start working on a new film, but to start instructions in the Catholic Church. And I, uh, I closed in St. Louis, and I flew to L.A. Gig was halfway through his little catechism. I met his religious instructor. His name was Father Doyle. He was a looker of note, by the way. Well, Gig said to me one day after one of his classes, he learned that Catholic priest is so good-looking I may overshoot the runway. <laughs> He didn't overshoot the runway, but we, we circled the airport for a couple of years. I, um, I drank every day, and um, Gig drank every day. I don't think I really knew who he was, and I don't think he really knew who I was. I don't think I really knew who I was. But the Baptist minister in St. Cloud, Minnesota, solved all our problems. He called the um, Catholic priest one afternoon, and what do you know? They found Gig's baptismal certificate. Well, all bets were off. I mean, that is, if I insisted on walking down the center aisle, and uh, you know what they say, once a Catholic. It began to look to me like Gig had originally made a deal with that Baptist minister to somehow conveniently lose his baptismal certificate. But it also began to look very much to me like Gig, a little tired by now of all this religious instruction. And I think he made a more recent deal with the Baptist minister to somehow conveniently find his baptismal certificate. It was all in fun, I guess. This thing was all in fun. When all is said and done, how far could it go? Gig drove me to the airport, and a close friend of his, a big 20th Century Fox executive type, real nice guy, he was on the same flight as I was. He let me cry on his shoulder all the way to Idlewild. I was a mess. Uh-uh, uh-uh. I wasn't in very good shape. I didn't know if I was crying because of Gig Young or because I couldn't get a third drink on American Airlines. <laughs> I got back to New York. I got back to New York, and I got lucky. I got <clears throat> Robert Whitehead, producer. I got um, Harold Clerman, director. I got Bill Inge, playwright. Kim Stanley was the star. Well, what I got was a play, a straight, legitimate play bus stop at the Music Box Theater on West 45th Street. And it was a hit, a big hit. My part was Grace. I ran a diner in Topeka, Kansas. I loved the part. And I loved that play. I loved every minute of being in it. And two months into the run, I got lucky again. I got Ben Gazzara. <clears throat> he was in a play by Tennessee Williams, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, at the Morosco Theater on West 45th Street. And I'd never met Ben Gazar, but I'd heard an awful lot about him. For openers, I'd heard he was married. But he was separated, so that's, that's a little bit better. So I, I got to thinking, I wonder if he's been baptized. <laughs> he called the Music Box Theater one matinee day between shows, and I just happened to answer the phone. It was, came through on the pay station by the stage door, and I was on my way out to dinner. And I picked up the phone, and whoever this was asked me to find out if Kim Stanley was busy after the show that night. I asked who was calling. He said, Ben Gazzara. I said, yes, Kim Stanley is busy after the show that night. 
He said, too bad. I said, I'm not. He said, who's this? I said, Elaine Stritch. He said, why not? And he took me to Downey Steakhouse on 8th Avenue for supper after the show. And then he took me home to my apartment on East 52nd Street. And he stayed for two years. <laughs> yes, well, I was into my 30s. A big shot movie mogul by the name of Sam Spiegel gave Ben his first movie, and he sent him to Rome to do publicity. And would you believe, at the same time, David O. Selznick sent me to Rome to be in a movie called A Farewell to Arms with Jennifer Jones and Rock Hudson. Now, Ben had asked me to marry him, so this was perfect. I mean, who cares if Ben was married before? We thought, when in Rome, you know, with the Pope, living there and all, <laughs> that maybe between the two of us, one of us might swing an annulment. Well, there was a slight hitch. I flipped over Rock Hudson. I was so knocked out by Rock Hudson that I used to do my own hair and makeup in my hotel room, just in case I might run into Rock Hudson at 6 a.m. on my way to hair and makeup at the studio. <laughs> he liked me. He liked me a lot, and he asked me out. He did, almost every night. I'm not kidding you. I was in heaven, just seeing Rock Hudson come down a winding staircase in the Grand Hotel in Rome in a tux to take me to dinner. I mean, come on. <laughs> it was just too much. Arrivederci, Ben Gazzara. <laughs> And we all know what a bum decision that turned out. <laughs> you know, Maybe if I'd had a Diet Coke or two somewhere along the way, <laughs> I might have made some grown-up decisions about a lot of things. But I didn't. Okay, I'm home from Rome, and I'll be damned if I didn't get lucky again, and with Robert Whitehead again. Elegant, classy, dishy Robert Whitehead. Great producer on Broadway, and he finally decided to produce his first musical. <clears throat> Name of the musical was Goldilocks. He also decided to give me the lead. Well, I was so excited. But you know, you never know. You know, you never know. It's a crapshoot. I mean, look, Robert Whitehead, producer. Walter Jean Kerr wrote the book. Leroy Anderson did the score. And, 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 and Agnes DeMille, the choreography. God, you'd think, wouldn't you? They just couldn't get it right. And one of the nights we couldn't get it right in Philadelphia, Noel Coward came to see the show. And at 11.30, he was at my dressing room door. Stretcher, your attempt to keep it light, keep it gay, keep it fragrant, impossible, I'm afraid. <laughs> the book is not very good, the score is not very good, the uh, direction is not very good, the choreography is not very good. The leading lady is quite good indeed, and she is alone in her dressing room in tears, having a very, very, very large scotch. <laughs> take heart, Stritchy. Any leading lady who doesn't do a double take when a nine-foot bear asks her to dance is my kind of actress. <laughs> Six to eight months later on the set of a TV sitcom, I was lucky enough to land in L.A. The AD informed me one morning I had an overseas phone call from Les Avants, Switzerland. Stritchy! I've written a musical for New York in the fall. The musical is called Sail Away. There's a part in it for you. It is not the lead, but it is a very, 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 very good part. <laughs> oh, my God, Mr. Coward. What if I'm not free? What if they pick up this sitcom in the fall? Stritcher, I have seen the sitcom. <laughs> Thank you.
they will not pick it up in the fall. <laughs> Sail Away went into rehearsal in the morning of July 2nd, 1961, and the night before, Noel Coward did something that I know now, and he knew then, of course, would give me the courage and confidence I needed. It was very simple what he did. He took me out to dinner to the posh Barbary room in the Berkshire Hotel. Champagne flowed, and before you knew it, I'm singing duets with the Noel Coward, accompanied by the Forrest Perrin, in the posh Barbary room of the Berkshire Hotel till 3 o'clock in the morning. In Noel Coward's script, Sail Away, the leading lady gets the guy in the end, naturally, and my part, the world-weary cruise hostess, Mimi Paragon, she gets the laughs. However, exactly two weeks before Sail Away, went into New York from Philadelphia. Noel Coward, together with the choreographer, the brilliant choreographer, Joe Layton, together they opted to combine the two parts, making it necessary, unfortunately, to sack the leading lady. <laughs> well, that's show business. <laughs> So now my part, Mimi Paragon, ends up with the laughs, but I also got the guy in the end, and I got the 11 o'clock number. Opening night of Sail Away on Broadway in New York, Noel Coward came to my dressing room. Stretcher, Alfred and Linny want us for the weekend in the Berkshires. I thought to myself, my God, not only is this kid from Michigan about to open any minute in a Noel Coward musical on Broadway, she's just been invited by Noel Coward, the Noel Coward, to weekend in the country with the Lunts. <laughs> Another thought suddenly grabbed me. Mr. Coward, if I don't get good notices tomorrow, can I still go to the Lunts? <laughs> no. <laughs> Travel, they say, improves the mind. An irritating platitude, which, frankly, entre nous, is very far from true. Personally, I have yet to find that longitude and latitude can educate those scores of monumental bores who travel in groups and herds and troops of various breeds and sexes till the whole world reels, who shouts and squeals and the clicking of rolly flexes. Why do the wrong people travel, travel, travel when the right people stay back home? What compulsion compels them and who the hell tells them to drag cans to Zanzibar instead of staying quietly in Omaha. The Taj Mahal and the Grand Canal and the sunny French Riviera would be less oppressed if the Middle West would settle for somewhere rather nearer. Please do not think that I criticize or cavil at a genuine urge to rise but why, oh, why do the wrong people travel when the right people stay back home and mind their business when the right people stay back home and eat hot donuts when the right people stay back home? I sometimes wonder why the right people stay Back home. Just when you think romance is ripe, it rather sharply dawns on you that each new serenade is for the tourist trade. Any attractive native type who resolutely fawns on you will give us his address, American Express. There isn't a rock between Bangkok 
And the beaches of his pianola That does not recoil From suntan oil And the gurgle of Coca-Cola Why do the wrong people Travel, travel, travel When the right people stay back home Explains this mass mania to leave Pennsylvania and clack around like flocks of geese, demanding dry martinis on the Isles of Greece. In the smallest streets where the gourmets meet, they invariably fetch up. And it's hard to make them accept a steak that isn't served rare and smeared with ketchup. Millions of tourists. Are churning up the gravel as they gaze at St. Peter's Dome. But why? Why do the wrong people travel when the right people stay back home with Cinerama? When the right people stay back home with all that. Kleenex when the right people stay back home with all that lettuce when the right people stay back home. I'm merely asking why the right You, your obsessions inspire those processions of families from Houston, Texas, with all of those cameras around their necks. They will take a train or an aeroplane for an hour on the Costa Brava, and they'll see Pompeii on the only day when it's up to its ass in molten lava. It would take years to unravel, ravel, ravel every impulse that makes them want to roll. But why? Why do the wrong people travel when the right people stay back home with Yogi Berra when the right people stay? Back home with Debbie Reynolds when the right people stay back home. Won't someone tell me why the right? I said the right people stay away back home. Way back. I remember, oh boy, do I remember, one matinee day in Philadelphia. Oh, it was a few weeks before Sail Away went into New York, and I was in my dressing room. Door was open, it always was, always is. It's lonely back there. And I remember I was just about to take my makeup off. Thank God I didn't. I looked up. And Richard Burton walked in. <laughs> he must have seen the matinee, because he was in Philadelphia. He was getting ready to open in, in Camelot. 
And I looked at Richard Burton, and I thought, hmm. <laughs> no. No. No, but I did think he might be, he might be going to ask me out to dinner between shows, like they say. Well, that didn't happen. Um, Elaine Stritch, he said, I have seen you many times out and about in New York City, and I have to confess, I have never once turned my head. <laughs> but halfway through your last number this afternoon, I almost had an orgasm. And then he kissed me on both cheeks and he walked out. <laughs> and I sat down at my dressing table and I looked in the mirror and I started to cry. Richard Burton got me to thinking. Yeah, it seems, um, it seems that I'm just a cat's meow in every way. From the time they call half hour till the curtain rings down. But just, oh, I don't know, taking Elaine out to supper after the show maybe, or to a movie, <laughs> something like that. That wasn't happening so much anymore. Oh, listen, give me the uh, co costumes, the scenery, the makeup, the props, you know, the audience that lifts you. According to Richard Burton, I could seduce a whole audience and never have to go to confession. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. And then I thought, I thought maybe, maybe this is the ball game, you know? Yeah, I thought maybe this is the way it was going to be. I thought maybe for me, this is it. Oh, man, sunshine, listen, you. Never tell me dreams come true. Just try it, and I'll start a riot. Beatrice Fairfax, don't you dare ever tell me he will care. I'm certain. It's the final curtain. I never want to hear from any cheerful Pollyanna who tells you fate supplies a mate. It's all bananas. I believe in doing what I can, crying when I must, laughing when I choose. Hey ho, if love were all, I would be lonely. I believe the more you love a man, the more you give your trust, the more you're bound to lose. Although when shadows fall, I think 
If only Somebody splendid Really needed me Someone affectionate and dear Cares would be ended if I knew that he wanted to have me near. He's knocking on a door, not for me. He'll plan a two by four, but not for me. When every happy plot ends with a marriage knot, but there's no knot. would be ended if I knew that he wanted to have me near. I believe that since my life began The most I've had is just a talent to amuse. Hey-ho! If love were all I wonder what Richard Burton meant, almost. <laughs> not long ago, not long ago, I was talking to Stephen Sondheim about a song that he wrote called I'm Still Here. And um, in conversation, I mentioned that uh, I had heard women in their 60s sing I'm Still Here. And on several occasions, women in their 50s sing I'm Still Here. Few times, women in their 40s sing, I'm still here. Where have they been? <laughs> so I, I told him, not that he asked me, but I told him <laughs> that I wouldn't touch that song until I was, until I felt justified to sing it. Till I was what? I don't know, 80 years old. I'm still here and I'm 80 years old. But you know, <laughs> It's such a terrific song, and I'm not going to wait 20 years to sing it. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> Good times and bum times, I've seen them all. My dear, I'm still here. Plush velvet sometimes, sometimes just pretzels and beer. But I'm here. I've stuffed the dailies in my shoes, strummed ukuleles, sung the blues. 
Seen all my dreams disappear But I'm here I've slept in Shanty's guest Of the WPA But I'm here Danced in my scanties Three bucks a night was the pay But I'm here I've stood on bread lines With the best Watched while the headlines Did the rest In the depression Was I depressed Nowhere near I met a big financier So I'm here I've been through Gandhi Wally and Windsor's affair But I'm here Amos and Andy Mahjan And platinum hair But I'm here I got through A.B.'s Irish Rose Five Dion babies Major bowls Had heebie-jeebies Poor babies Bathosphere I lived through Brenda Frazier And I'm here I've gotten through Herbert and J. Edgar Hoover Gee, that was fun and a half When you've been through Herbert and J. Edgar Hoover Anything else is a laugh I've been through Reno, I've been through Beverly Hills, <laughs> and I'm here. Reefers and Vino, rescuers, religion, and pills, but I'm here. Been called a pico, commie tool, got through its stinko by my pool. I should have gone to an acting school, that seems clear. Still, someone said she's sincere, so I'm here. Black sable one day, next day, it goes into hot. But I'm here. Top billing Monday, Tuesday, you're touring in stock. through. Hey, lady, aren't you? Who's this? Wow, what a looker you were. Or better yet, sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. I thought you were who's this? Yeah, whatever happened to her? Good times and bum times. I've seen them all in my dear. Still here. Pelish velvet sometimes. And beer. But I'm here. I have run the gamble A to Z. Three cheers, damn it. Say la vie. I got through all of last year and I'm here. Christ knows, at least I was there.
I'm angry. I'll get over it, but I am. I'm sore as hell that I had to go through what I had to go through to get through what I had to get through. <laughs> and you know what helped? You know what helped me a lot? Booze. It's scary up here. You know, so, so, you're scared, you drink, you're not scared. What is the problem? So for 58 or nine of those years that I got through all of, I never put a foot on a stage without a drink. Or any place else, come to think of it. <laughs> but I was very disciplined about all this. I had rules. Up here especially, any place else, who cares who's counting? But up here, two drinks. One before the curtain, another at intermission, a little backup, and that was it. Well, three maybe. <laughs> no, if I had the 11 o'clock number. Here's a story about having a drink or two before coming out here. Brilliant performer, George Goebel, standing in the wings before, before a performance with a drink in his hand. And he turns to his buddy, a fellow performer, standing next to him, about to go on next with no drink in his hand. Hey, buddy, where's your drink? No more, George, I quit. You quit? You quit? Jesus Christ, you mean you're going out there alone? <laughs> out here alone? Not me. Not on your tintype. I'm with you, George. I want a friend out here with me. And actually, I've had quite a variety of friends out here with me through the years. Angel in the Wings, Canadian Club, Pal Joey, Beaujolais Village, Call Me Madam, White Wine, On Your Toes, Doers. Uh, bus stop, Schlitz, uh, Goldilocks, anything I could get my hands on. <laughs> Sail away, well, no coward, what else? Don Perignon, uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, Schmirnoff, Company, Courvoisier. Oh, and I did a play in L.A. with Lawrence Harvey. Boy, oh boy, did I need a friend out here with me on that one. And uh, incidentally, I never hid booze from anyone. Nobody, never, not ever. All through the years, my dressing rooms have been openly well-stocked. But in this, in this play, Time of the Barracudas, aptly named, our producer, Freddie Brisson, married to Rosin Russell, and better known as the Lizard of Roz, he said, <laughs> he set down a hard and a fast rule he did in his production no booze backstage. I think I can safely say without fear of successful contradiction, I had a lot to do with that regulation. But never mind, I had to outwit Freddie Brisson. I had to, I couldn't do his play if I couldn't have my two drinks. So, what's the ticket? Champagne, champagne's the ticket. I succeeded in uh, engineering with the help of the bartender across the street at the Brown Derby, a removable champagne cork. And we put the wire and the foil all neatly around the top of the cork. And then at the bottom of the cork, we whittled down so it would fit easily on or off the top of the bottle, slide right on or off the top of the bottle. So there'd be no pop, see? No noise, no nothing. And then Charlie the bartender would have one of these creations all dolled up, of course, in ribbons and a bucket of shaved ice, delivered to the stage door of the Huntington Hartford Theater in Los Angeles to me before every performance. I wrote the cards. <laughs> Monday night, all the best, Elaine, Tony Curtis. <laughs> Tuesday night, have fun, Mickey Rooney. Wednesday matinee, knock them dead, Jimmy Cagney. Wednesday night, give them hell, Judy Garland. Thursday night, thanks for the memory, Pop, Bob Hope. Friday night, love and kisses, Liberace. Saturday matinee, you're my favorite, Shirley Temple. <laughs> Saturday night, Mazel Tov, Cary Grant. Now, Freddie Brisson would come backstage almost every single night, wishing at half hour, wishing me well. Oh, yeah, 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 and checking me out. Make no mistake about that. But he couldn't very well object, could, it, could he, to, 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 to an unopened, gift-wrapped quart of champagne. Sometimes he'd hang around till just before the curtain went up. 
son of a bitch. <laughs> just in case he just might maybe hear a pop. Well, he never did. <laughs> and I was able to have my two rather large hits of bubbly throughout the course of the evening. Look, the play closed. And they blame me, I think. And I have to say, in all fairness, I got terrific notices. But you know, that doesn't always count in the theater. I mean, if a show closes and you're in it, and you so much as have a dry sherry at tea time, it's going to turn out to be your, your fault. Okay, as long as we're spiraling downwards. I did a performance of um, um, uh, The Women, a play by Claire Booth Luce in summer stock. Uh, Warren, Ohio, the John Kenley Players in Warren, Ohio. Here's the cast list. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refer to the uh, stars' names that did the movie version of the women, so you'll get the picture. The Ross and Russell part was played by uh, Marilyn Maxwell. And uh, the Joan Crawford part was played by uh, Claire Luce. Now, that's the actress, not the, uh, not the writer. And, um, oh, uh, Dagmar. Remember Dagmar? She was in it. I forget what part she played. <laughs> Believe me, it doesn't matter. <laughs> the Paulette Goddard part, that was me. The uh, Norma Shearer part, was played by Marge Champion. Oh, and the Countess, the Mary Boland part, that was played by Gloria Sunset Boulevard Swanson. And let's see. Uh, oh, and uh, the Joan Fontaine part was played by my friend Imelda DeMartin. Well, actually, she was the only friend I had left when the curtain came down on opening night. <laughs> Two nights before the women closed, <clears throat> Amelda de Martin sent me a note with two huge false eyelashes pasted on the note paper, and underneath she wrote, Gloria Swanson sends her best. This is it. <clears throat> we all shacked up. We all shacked up at a very elegant motel, I must say. The sign out front read, The Women is here. All except Gloria Swanson. Gloria Swanson lived in her very own trailer right next door to the motel with two extremely attractive gay men, one cooking up her seaweed, the other cooking up her memoirs. <laughs> day one, rehearsal. Day one, rehearsal. 10 a.m., all the women were there, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, ready to go to work. No director. He didn't arrive until 10.55. And believe it or not, his opening remarks to the company, ladies... There is one thing about which I am. I just happen to be an absolute stickler. Promptness. He actually said that. And then he went on, he went on from there to grow day by day more and more fearful of us all. The inmates, indeed, were running the asylum. Gloria Swanson had a little difficulty remembering her lines. So she very early on, and unbeknownst to any one of us, she made a little quiet deal with the assistant stage manager, Heather McRae, that should she forget a line during a performance, she would signal Miss McRae, who would be lying flat out behind a yellow sofa on stage with a script of the women, of course. She'd signal her by calling out, Ole! <laughs> Okay, opening night. My first scene was with the Countess, Miss Swanson. And it takes place in a uh, gay divorcee's dude ranch in Reno, Nevada. This is opening night of the women in summer stock. My first entrance, my first line. Hiya, Countess. How's rhythm on the range? <clears throat> Ole! Jesus Christ. <laughs> I looked behind me. I, honest to God, thought that two Spanish dancers had followed me on this. <laughs> now I'm up higher than a kite. I don't know what to do. I look at Miss Swanson, and she doesn't know anything at all. <laughs> so I turn up stage towards the bar, which is directly parallel to the yellow sofa. Eh? But before I go up there, I try to save the day, and I ad lib. Okay, Countess, what do you say? Come on, why not? Let's have a drink. Holy shit! (laughs) 
And that was a hard ad lib to cover. <laughs> Let's skip to the last scene of the play. It takes place in the powder room at El Morocco nightclub in New York City. Now, <clears throat> according to Miss Luce's script, I'm supposed to exit from the nightclub with the Countess. But Miss Swanson had made it very clear early on that she was not about to exit in this play or any other play with me or anybody else. <laughs> so, the director came to me. Uh, uh, sweetie, I've okayed Miss Swanson's solo exit, <clears throat> but would you be an angel and uh, help me out here a little bit? Um, when Miss Swanson exits, could you just stay on the stage till the curtain comes down? <laughs> well, I, I have no more lines. Yes, I know. Isn't it terrible? <laughs> but the play isn't over, so all right, I'll stay out here, but... All right, when Miss Swanson exits, is it all right if I just stay, if I, if I do stay out here, if I react to whatever else is going on on the stage until the curtain does come down? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, l let's skip to the last scene of the play, all right? Last scene of the play, opening night. It is now... 20 minutes after 11. I'm on a little chair in El Morocco's powder room, downstage right, looking into a little mirror. Miss Swanson is long gone, out the door, leaving only one more solo exit to go. Miss Champions. Miss Champion is over here, stage left, downstage left, sitting on a little chair in front of a little mirror. Miss Swanson, the Countess, exits. Miss Champion fluffs up. <laughs> for a while. <laughs> she then rises slowly. It's 11.30. <laughs> she is sporting a long flowing sea green chiffon gown with two additional single folds of chiffon flowing from each shoulder, left over from her club act with Gower, I'm sure. In which she was brilliant. She then moves, so to speak, to center stage, to the foot of the three steps that lead to the exit. She then turns full out to the audience to deliver the last two lines of what used to be Claire Booth Luce's hit play, The Women. <laughs> Ever so slowly, with her right hand, she throws her right single fold of chiffon over her left shoulder. Even more slowly, it's a quarter to 12. With her left hand, she throws her left single fold of chiffon over her right shoulder. Jungle red, Sylvia. Good night. <laughs> Lady. <laughs> now I'm on my little chair, having sat glued 
to Miss Champion's every fusty and nuance with no lines so as not to distract the focus of the audience on Miss Champion's final moments. And I'm beginning to think to myself, as I'm sure every member of that audience is thinking to themselves by now, yes. Yes, I think. Wait a minute. Yes. I think it is. Yes. I think it, it is. It is. At last. Yes. Yes. It is. It is. Thank God. It is. Fucking over. And I go, I go. With the possible exception of Imelda de Martin, not one of the women spoke to me at the opening night party. I compounded my own felony the next morning. I got pretty good notices. The women, on the other hand, were busy composing a letter. Elaine Stritch, due to alcohol and or pills, rose to a level of performing opening night that none of us were accustomed to. And then they all signed it, with the exception, surprise, surprise, of Miss Gloria Swanson, she was on my side. Good for you, Glow. The rest of these ladies went over to uh, Mr. Kenley's apartment, and they presented him with this letter. And they instructed him to deliver it post-haste to Actors' Equity. Uh, Mr. Kenley was sympathetic. Elaine, if these ladies behaved on stage the way they're behaving off stage, we'd have a hit. <laughs> Apparently, they had all threatened to leave if I stayed on, so Mr. Kenley begged me to comply. Everything in my dressing room had been cleared out that morning and sent to me, but I decided to, certainly I was going to cooperate with Mr. Kenley, but I was going to show up in costume and makeup at half hour. I wanted to prove that I was ready to go on, whether they thought I was or not. I was uh, detained in the parking lot. The attendant had been given strict orders not to allow Elaine Stritch inside the theater. What a shame. And I do so love the theater. <laughs> and as John Barrymore once put it, and all the charming people in it. <laughs> I, um, I consulted a lawyer back in New York. Elaine, you can fight this thing, you know? You can call attention to this, Elaine. And maybe in 10 years' time, in small print on the last page of the Equity magazine, you might very well be exonerated. Or you can what? Let it go. So I what? I let it go. I let it go. Okay. Moving right along. A high-powered casting agent by the name of Joel Thurm in New York City thought I'd be a shoe-in for a part in a new CBS sitcom. I flew to L.A. My agent picked me up at the Bel Air Hotel. We had a couple of beers. My quota went on the job. And we drove into Hollywood. And I auditioned in a room full of CBS hotshots. And the writer, oh yes, the writer, with a heavily sprayed Doris Day hairdo and an attitude. She didn't like me on sight, and I knew it. So I tried to win her over. Thank you so much for considering me for a part in your terrific script. And it was. It was a damn good script. But I want to be up front with you. Um, at first readings, I guess it's because I'm so nervous, like everybody else, I guess, but I have this tendency, and this was true, I have this tendency to, um, when I get nervous like that, to kind of fool around with the dialogue just a little bit. Hopefully, says the writer, just the punctuation. <laughs> Well, if that's the way she was going to play it. Well, 
mm, maybe a little bit more than just a punctuation. Uh, for instance, here you've got the houseboy entering to set the bar up, and my line is, Ying, don't forget the hors d'oeuvres. Would it be okay if I said, Ying, don't forget the fucking hors d'oeuvres? <laughs> The CBS Hot Shots laughed a lot. The writer, she didn't think it was funny at all. Oh, well, hell with it. <laughs> who cares? And who knew, you know? Well, I mean, how could I know? What I mean is, how, how could I know then? And even if I did know then, who cared? Yeah. Who really gave a shit about playing some old broad who settles in Miami with two other old broads and her mother? <laughs> I blew it. I blew it. I didn't get the job. I blew it. I blew a 35, 40, 50, if they want to be badly enough, thousand dollar per episode for the first 13 and after that, who knew, job. I blew it. I blew a multi-million, zillion dollar, international syndicated, residual grabbing, bopperoony, smasheroony, television situation, comedy entitled, The Golden Girls. <laughs> Back to New York, to the theater. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly when this was, but, well, it was 1969, that I know, and late, late November, late November, had to be. And I, uh, I'm in New York, and my telephone isn't ringing off the hook. I know that for sure. But it did ring one afternoon and um, turned out to be a writer by the name of Lee Israel. I'd heard of her. She was a well thought of writer. And she asked me if I would let her interview me for the New York Times. And the subject matter was going to be the ups and downs of an actress in the American theater. I said, sure, why not? Well, it seems in this interview that I had bitterly, and probably after a few shooters, I had alluded to the fact that I was totally disillusioned with my chosen profession and with a lot of the lousy directors in it. Oh, I went on. I went on to say that if there was a director somewhere in this town who knew more than I did, would he please call me? <laughs> Two days after the interview appeared in the New York Times, I picked up my phone and a voice said, Elaine, this is Hal Prince and I know more than you do. It's the little things you do together, do together, do together that make perfect relationships. The hobbies you pursue together, savings you accrue together, looks you misconstrue together, that make marriage a joy. Uh -huh. First reading of the musical company in New York City. A semicircle of 14 classy actors all gathered together to sing and say practically anything and everything to do with life, love, and the musical marital pursuit of happiness down in the lounge at the Schubert Theater. It's the little things you share together, swear together, wear together that make perfect relationships. The concerts you enjoy together, neighbors you annoy together, children you destroy together that keep marriage intact. Off to Boston to open in company. Fear set in. This was big time, and I was scared. 
aside from all the grueling physical, mental, and emotional energy that Michael Bennett, the brilliant choreographer, demanded from each and every one of us, I must have further exhausted myself trying to find somebody to stay up with me at night after the show. Well, it's a little Judy Garland in all of us, right? Judy Garland. She said to me one night, it was her closing night at the palace, and there was a big party, a big celebration, and Judy Garland and I were still at it at 8 o'clock in the morning when she rose to her full height in that orange sequin sheath with the slit up the side, her comeback dress, I called it. She loved that. And she put her hand out to me, and she said, Elaine, I never thought I'd say this, but good night. <laughs> to Boston, back to Boston, and our, our stage manager, Fritz Holt, the best ever, he all of a sudden, out of the blue, suggests that we bunk together. We'll split the hotel, Elaine, save money, and I'll kill you every night. Well, now you're talking. Of course, I knew this was all arranged by the hot shots, just so they'd know where Elaine Stritch was at every hour of the day and night. Well, didn't bother me. I could live with that. I was nuts about Fritz Holt. It's not talk of God and the decade ahead that allows you to get through the worst. It's I do and you don't and nobody said that. And who brought the subject up first? They even went so far as to get Larry Kurt, who stood by for Dean Jones and later played the lead in New York on Broadway. They got Larry to ask me out to an early dinner on the day of the opening in Boston. Well, this too was arranged by the Hot Shots. They just, they just wanted to get a slight idea of Elaine's cocktail hour intake before a performance. It's the little things, the little things, the little things, the little things. Came time for my big number opening night, and um, mm -mm, those lyrics just wouldn't come out. I was terrified, and in what must have been abject fear, like some scared little kid, when I forgot a line to my song, don't ask me why, I put both of my hands inside my mouth. And then when I got back on track with the, the lyrics in my head, I took both of my hands out of my mouth, and I finished in sync with the orchestra, thank God, I finally finished, for better or worse, Stephen Sondheim's three-act play, The Ladies Who Lunch. It's the little ways you try together, cry together, lie together, that make perfect relationships. The call sheet went up. 11 a.m., Hal Prince, full company. 10 a.m., Hal Prince, Elaine Stridge. 10 a.m., my dressing room. Elaine, halfway through, now I know you were nervous. Halfway through your number, and I am only asking you this out of curiosity. <laughs> halfway through your number last night, Elaine, you put both of your hands in your mouth. Why? Uh, I was looking for the lyrics. <laughs> well, I guess, in a way, that could explain it. But now, Elaine, that is behind you. Now, do you want to come with me and we'll join the rest of the company for the 11 o'clock call? <sighs> Hal Prince trusted me. I knew it. I just knew he did. And it was that trust that gave me the courage to deliver for him for the next two and a half years. It's not so hard to be married when two maneuver as one. It's not so hard to be married 
and Jesus Christ is it fun. Company opens on Broadway. Aha! Uh -huh. Glorious. Winners all. Kiss, kiss. Ladies who lunch. Look, Ma. No hands. I'd like to propose a toast. Here's to the ladies who lunch. Everybody laugh. Lounging in their caftans and planning a brunch on their own. Behalf. Off to the gym, then to a fitting, claiming their fat. And looking grim, cause they've been sitting, choosing a hat. Does anyone still wear a hat? I'll drink to that. Here's to the girls who stay smart. Aren't they a gas? Rushing to their classes in optical art, wishing it would pass. Another long, exhausting day, another thousand dollars, a matinee, a pin to play, perhaps a piece of ballers. I'll drink to that. And one for Mahler. Here's to the girls who play wife. Aren't they too much? Keeping house but clutching a copy of life just to keep in touch. The ones who follow the rules and meet themselves at the schools too busy to know that they're fools. to the girls who just watch aren't they the best when they get depressed it's a bottle of scotch plus a little chest another chance to disapprove another brilliant singer another reason not to move Another vodka stinger I'll drink to that So here's to the girls on the go Everybody tries Look into their eyes And you'll see what they know Everybody dies A toast to that invincible bunch The dinosaur surviving the crunch Let's hear it For the ladies who lunch Everybody rise 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 Rise
at Her Majesty's Theatre in the West End of London, I did my last performance of company, and um, I was tired. I was seriously tired. I had been Bobby Baby and Bobby Booby for 782 performances. I needed a holiday, so I took one. I went to Land's End. That's as far west as you can go in this country, they tell me, before your hat floats. And it occurred to me that it was the first time I had ever made my own travel plans. You know, no company manager with the tickets, no stage manager with the, with the call sheet, no company. There was nobody. <clears throat> it was just me. I was alone. And I started to do some thinking, some tall thinking. Where was I going? And more importantly, who, if anybody, was going with me? It turned out, back in London, I had two engagements waiting for me. One, a straight, legitimate play, and the other, a straight, legitimate fella I was about to meet in the straight, legitimate play. The play was Tennessee Williams' Small Craft Warnings, and the fella was John Bay. And after four and a half, closer to five weeks of rehearsal, in the gardens behind the Savoy Hotel, my residence at the time, at a rate you would not believe, <laughs> in front of the statue of Gilbert and Sullivan in the gardens there, overlooking the Thames, I proposed to John Bay. John was an incredible mimic. Yeah, he could move and sound exactly like just about anybody. And one of my favorites was Jack Benny. His answer to my proposal of marriage, why not? <laughs> well, we pooled our rehearsal pay, and we crossed the strand, and we went to a little jewelry shop, and we bought two single gold wedding bands, and we opted to live at the Savoy. John said, Elaine, your rate's too good. You can't afford to move. <laughs> and then he saw me home, and he went to collect his gear. His digs were in Kensington Gardens. And uh, I closed the door behind him, and I threw myself on the bed, and I shouted, yes! You know, like the kids do today. My joy was overpowering. I just didn't know what to do with it. Just think. He was coming back here, and he was going to stay with me. And he did. He came back, and he stayed with me for 10 years, till carcinoma, monoma, castasiosis fucked everything up. I loved being married. I'd love to be married again. But I can't find him. Not anywhere. Not even close. There never was a baby like my baby. No other baby ever had that smile. And since he's gone, I just can't be a cry baby. Cause my baby made life worthwhile. There never was another guy or doll baby who looked exactly like my valentine. He was specially designed for me. And if you want his double brother, are you in trouble never 
No, never. Oh, baby. Like mine. It was a late afternoon in London, and John and I were on our way to the theater. And we walked through Covent Garden. And um, we, we decided to, to uh, stop in Rule's Restaurant. It's the oldest restaurant in London, so they tell me. And uh, we had a glass of wine. And we got the news from the Mater D, hot off the wireless. Noel Coward, dead at 73. I think I said shit, I'm not sure. But I was so sad. I remember I said to John, I wish they'd let me write Noel Coward's epitaph. I would choose just the title of a quintessential Noel Coward song. I've been to a marvelous party with Nuna and Nana and Nell. It was in the fresh air, and we went as we were, and we stayed as we were, which was hell. Poor Lulu got fried on Chianti and talked about esprit de corps. I knew the excitement was bound to begin when Laura got blind on Dubonnet and gin and scratched her veneer with a Cartier pin. I couldn't have liked it more. It was about that time in London that I sort of began to kind of think that all those marvelous parties weren't so all that marvelous after all. But it was just a thought. I was doing just great. Yeah, company had been a huge success in the West End. And um, small craft warnings, big hit. And then I did Neil Simon's play, Gingerbread Lady. Big hit in the West End. Oh, and the TV award-winning uh, sitcom with Don, Donald Sinden, Two's Company. Big hit. I was, I'm telling you, I was knocking them dead in the UK. I was also maybe a little more frequently knocking them back in the UK. But it didn't seem to get in the way of anything. Alan René, the famous French film director, he saw me in Gingerbread Lady, and he flew me to Paris to be in his movie, Providence, with John Gielgud, Dirk Bogart, and Ellen Burstyn. This was big-time stuff. And on the last day of the shooting in Paris, John and I decided to give a party in the gardens behind the uh, Lancaster Hotel, where we were staying, on the Rue de Berry, off the Champs-Élysées. And on that glamorous, glorious night in Paris, Alan René told me that he was more than pleased with my work in the movie. And John Gielgud told me that he thought I could really act. And Dirk Bogart told me that he thought I had sex appeal. And John Bay told me that he loved me. Well, oh my God. I mean, I was about as happy as I have ever been in my whole life that night about everything. Now, I couldn't have that, could I? Uh-uh, I had to do something about that. So I did. I had more than a lifetime share of brandy stingers, and I woke up the next morning a nervous, mental, emotional, and physical wreck. I flung open the minibar, poured myself a Diet Coke, preparing to face the rest of my life without booze. A month rolled by, and I became a totally insulin-dependent diabetic. I can handle that. It's a manageable disease. Another month rolled by, and I was brilliantly controlling my blood sugar. So I thought, what about the booze? What about controlling the booze? Oh, enough of this total abstinence nonsense. Control. That's the operative word. Two drinks a day. Two drinks a day. On or off stage. Two drinks a day. Two drinks a day. Two drinks a day. It doesn't work. 
Not when you want 11. <laughs> and not when you start shopping for wine glasses in the vase department at Bloomingdale. <laughs> But if you'll pardon the pun, I gave it a shot. <laughs> I'm back in New York, and I'm on the set of Woody Allen's film, September. And I'm on my two-a-day regime. And I'd go to the AD first thing every morning to find out what time my scenes were shooting. I never had more than one or two scenes in one, uh, in one day on that film. And then I would save my two vodkas, my drug of choice at that particular time. I'd save them until just before the cameras rolled. Because, you see, I couldn't go out there alone, either. The last day of the film, I was told I had two scenes. Perfect. Two vodkas, two scenes. Elaine, one retake. Shit. <laughs> so what? I mean, it's last day of the film. So, I'll have three vodkas. Can't hurt. Rap party! This is getting boring. I want to go to the party. I'm going to go to the party. I'm going to have... I'll have... Why not? I, I, I'll have four vodkas. I feel like it. Son of a bitch. And be, uh, besides, <laughs> who cares? I got back to the Carlisle Hotel where I was living and just outside the door of my hotel room, my blood sugar fell dramatically, and so did I. I had, I had a major diabetic hypoglycemic attack. I, um, I needed sugar in any way, shape, or form. I needed sugar. A Dominican Republic minibar waiter saved my life. Just happened to be on my floor with a Pepsi. All of a sudden, huh? There's God so quickly. So, I decided to pay him back. I quit. I quit. I quit, and I am not, this time, kidding around. Party's over. It's time to call it a day. It's time to wind up a masquerade. Just make your mind up. The piper must be paid.
all over. Thank God. My friends, and so, so many, so many people that I am, um, well, I don't want to get sentimental, but there were, there were a lot of people who gave me a hand through this. And uh, they weren't really specific incidences. They were more like, oh, I don't know, inspirational moments that I just, I can't get out of my memory. One was the first time I ever came out here alone. Was it a concert at the Hollywood Bowl in Los Angeles. I don't like to think of how scared I was that night in the wings before coming out here for the first time alone. And out of the blue, Michael Feinstein squeezes my hand. You'll stop shows again, Elaine, not tonight. Tonight, just get through it. <laughs> I'm back in New York and I'm walking tall maybe four or five weeks now and a black kid passes me on Madison Avenue riding his bike heading uptown. Smile, mama, you looking good. <laughs> Edward Albee calling me on Christmas morning. Make sure I'm not alone. Remembering Ruthie Mitchell, Hal Prince's co-producer on Company, I overdid the brandy one Saturday night. Curtain came down. No screaming and hollering from Ruthie, no threats. She just looked at me and said, extraordinary talent, Elaine, don't fuck it up. <laughs> Message on my voicemail at the Regency Hotel from a waiter in the library, Gary Blanks. How's the blood sugar? I'm on till midnight. You need anything? Auditioning for George S. Kaufman for Cole Porter's musical, Silk Stockings. She's great, says the producer, but she's got no sex appeal. In that case, says George S. Kaufman, neither have I. And he walks out, and he takes me with him. Arlene Dahl, Mark Rosen, Donald Stannard, and Terry Hecker, three close friends of mine who never forget every single year. Without fail, they never forget to celebrate with me Groundhog's Day. It's my birthday. The way I feel when Mr. Vincent is finished with my hair, that helps. Makeup, Charlotte and Marietta, they make me feel good about myself. Oh, and Stephen Sondheim's approval, that'll keep you on the straight and narrow for two or three years. Liz Smith, who writes for the New York Post, makes the world think I'm far more famous than I ever could be. Jerry Gutierrez, who directed me in Edward Albee's play, A Delicate Balance, with such sensitivity and such understanding. Jerry Gutierrez taught me how to play a drunk, sober. In his acceptance speech on national television, Hal Prince receiving his 785th Tony <laughs> named me the backbone of his production of Showboat on Broadway, and that, folks, beats a Tony. Georgine and Sally, my two older sisters, they look after me before, during, and after everything. And my mother and father. But I'm, um, I'm a little afraid to go there. Okay, so. What has this all been about then? This existential problem in tights. <laughs> I'm, I think I know, I think I know what I've been doing up here tonight. I've been, I've been reclaiming a lot of my life that I wasn't honestly and truly there for. Beckett says it. <laughs> Beckett says, absent always. Okay, I'll paraphrase. Absent almost always. Oh, my goodness. It almost all happened without me. But I caught up.
and I'm up here, and I'm out here, and I'm alone. And I'm feeling a little, not a lot, but I'm feeling a little like Brandon DeWilde, little Brandon DeWilde, six years old, on Broadway, in Carson McCullers' beautiful play, A Member of the Wedding. And it's opening night, and all the grown-up actors are in their respective dressing rooms, Ethel Waters, um, Julie Harris, and William Henson, and Phyllis Love, and they're all, you know, opening night on Broadway. They're all scared to death, shaking in their boots. And little Brandon DeWilt is in his dressing room at the end of the hall. And at the other end of the hall, the stage manager, just about to call. The curtain's about to go up, opening night on Broadway. Places! And little Brandon DeWilder comes out of his dressing room and starts skipping down the hall, knocking on all the grown-up actors' dressing room doors. It's time! It's time! It's time! Jesus Christ! <laughs> What an attitude. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> and incidentally, it's time. <laughs> Wicked childhood. <laughs> Perhaps I had a miserable youth, but somewhere in my wicked, miserable past, there must have been a moment of truth. For here you are, there you are, loving me. Whether or not you should. So somewhere in my youth or childhood, I must have done something nothing comes from nothing nothing ever could so somewhere in my youth or childhood I must have done something good good night and thank you all so very much <laughs>